We are continuing our series that is, um, it's about what's called hope for a messed up world. And we've been looking at a, a few different uh, aspects of our messed up world. And uh, first of all, we just kind of talked in general for the first week about hope for a messed up world. We talked about hope then for messed up people. That's us. And by, by messed up, I mean sinful. We talked about hope for messed up plans. And reflecting there, especially on the fact that, I mean, Joseph had big plans. This was last week and everything got turned upside down and he trusted in God and, and God had a bigger plan, a more important plan. It was it just really cool to see how God works. Today, we're going to talk about hope when others are messed up. And that's not to deny our own issues and our own sins and our own faults. But as we look at the different aspects of of living in an imperfect, messed up world, there's us and then there's the people around us and, and messed up events that happen. And so we're going to focus here today on a particular event that is quite honestly just messed up. We're not going to really dig deep into what happened. We're just going to more talk about it uh, because it's it's horrible what, what Herod did uh, around the time of Jesus' birth. And I'll be reading the account soon. Uh, and and yet, the we, we don't want to lose sight of the bigger picture, that there is hope. There's hope for us in any and every situation because we have an awesome God. So let me read selected verses from Matthew chapter 2. It says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi, or sometimes we call them the wise men, from the east, by the way, there's no way that there was only three of them. All the all the all the iconic images have just three, maybe because they gave three gifts, but it's a good chance it was a sizable caravan. So Magi came from the east to Jerusalem and asked, "Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him." When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. I'll explain that in the message. When he had called together all the, chief, the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. <clears throat> Emphasis there on Bethlehem, because the question was, where would this king of the Jews be born? Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. I'm going to skip ahead a couple of verses. Uh, that's where they give him the gifts, but we'll talk about that more, or that'll be more a part of our, our Christmas celebrations. Jumping ahead, it says then that the, the wise men, having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, <coughs> excuse me, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt, I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been, <coughs> excuse me. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and younger, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said to the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. For those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. So you may know this, but usually this. Well, portion of Matthew chapter two is is part of the of a Christmas service or after Christmas. This is what we call the epiphany account where the, the wise men, the Magi from the East come 
and they visit uh, the the very young Jesus, give him uh, generous gifts. It, it's usually something we, we, we look at after Christmas, and it's also a, a reading that we usually stop at verse 12, and, and verse 12 is um, where they where they were warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, and so they returned by another route. We we usually don't handle this part where it talks about what Herod did with the baby boys aged two years old and younger, um, which is absolutely horrible. I, I'll be honest with you, I didn't love reflecting, and I didn't like do a deep dive into that or focus on you know, the, this, this, this act that, that, that took place, but, but it certainly it was the context in which <clears throat> I was preparing a sermon this week. And I, I'll be honest, I didn't love that. It was um, not my favorite portion of scripture to, to be chewing on. And, and again, it, it was an absolutely horrible thing. I mean, what kind of a person would do that? What kind well, I, I guess we're, we're not going to get too much into King Herod and who he was, uh, but let me just say this. He was a ruthless, brutal king and, and known for it. It, it says in the, in the text that when Herod was disturbed, all Jerusalem was disturbed with him because they knew that when, when Herod got nervous, when he was disturbed, when he got upset, bad things happened. People died. In fact, on one occasion, just to give one example, uh, King Herod, I shouldn't say in one example, but in general, I, uh, history tells us that King Herod had even some of his own family members killed because he was so possessive of his position. And he was, <clears throat> he was, he was paranoid of, of, of losing it. Which then really, I guess, as again, we consider this, this portion of scripture with this event, uh, there are some logical, I think, natural questions that come to mind. Like, 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 like how could God let this happen? And why? What was the point? And, and then for myself, I think, well, you know, what about when, you know, there are very difficult situations that happen to us in, in, in the world around us and things that are really, really uh, difficult for us to make sense of? What do we do at, at, at those times and in those situations? Well, we'll we'll consider these questions. But really, as I said earlier, the point is we, we still want to make sure that we don't lose sight of the bigger picture here. And and I don't I don't believe we will here here today. Uh, but first of all, that question, how could God let this happen? And, and that's a common question when there's difficult things going on, when there's um, uh, just very troubling things, horrible things, horrific things, tragedies, natural disasters, pandemics. Uh, you know, how could God let this happen? We talk about how God is in control. We talk about how God is, is how he protects us and, and he delivers us. But then there are situations like this. How could God let this happen? And while that I believe is a logical, natural question that it, it's where our minds go, it's really the question that the devil wants us to ask, I believe, right? Be, be, because think about it. It fails to acknowledge the utterly corrupt nature of sin. It, it's, taking, it, it, it's taking the attention off of the real cause for all evil in this world, which is sin. And now it's saying, hey, God, how could you let this happen? It, it's... It, it fails to acknowledge, or at least takes the attention off that the, the, the reality of the utter corrupt nature of sin. And instead, it, it, it's pointing the finger of, of blame onto God. And, and so if we're going to talk about pointing fingers or, or, or who did what, I, I, that would be helpful, I think, here. I mean, let's consider in this account who did what to see really um, w w where our attention should be if we're going to talk about blame, if we're going to talk about fault. I mean, it was God who made the Magi aware that something really, really special was happening. It was God who, who used this star, th this special star. It's, it's widely believed that this was a star used just that God created and used just for this one occasion, and, and a big occasion, but he, he, he used a special star to lead these wise men to the privilege of meeting the Savior of the world, their Savior, your Savior, my Savior, face to face. That's really cool. Right. It, it's, it's God who brought the comfort of the gospel to the souls of those wise men. And by the way, again, there was a whole lot more than just three of them, most certainly. And, and in the process, God brought this news of the birth of the Savior of the world into Jerusalem to the king, King Herod, and to the, the chief priests and teachers of the law. What, what Herod and those religious leaders did with that information, with that news, 
was quite honestly entirely up to them. God, what was God doing? He, what did God do in all this? He, he fulfilled prophecy, as you heard in, in the lesson on a number of occasions. He executed his plan of salvation. The, the, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, weren't they quite complacent? I mean, they, they were brought in as the experts. They were asked a question. They did their research. They found the answer. They, 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 they quoted an Old Testament verse. And then it's like they just went back to what they had been doing before. It didn't really sink deep into, you know, and, and it didn't seem to do much for them. Herod was paranoid. Again, who did what here? You heard all those things that God did. The, the, the chief priests and the teachers of the law were complacent. Herod was paranoid. He saw Jesus as a threat. And, and, and we know then what that led him to do. You know, oddly, there are some lessons here for us, even in Herod and, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law. For example, do you ever see God, do you ever see Jesus as a threat? Perhaps that's not how you would articulate it. Perhaps that word isn't part of your vocabulary or at least part of the dialogue, I should say, when you consider your relationship with God. But I mean, think about it. Is is God and, and, and prioritizing God ever kind of an inconvenience, an inconvenience to your, your schedule, your, your, your busy life? Um, or maybe he's one who just kind of gets in the way of how you'd really like to live your life, at least according to the sinful nature. Or, or maybe sometimes uh, it, it's frustrating Right, because God's truths and his morals don't align with the sinful world around us. And and we have friends and loved ones who who don't believe in God and whose truths and morals don't then align with God and 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 we want to relate to those those folks, those people we love, and we want to validate them. But it's hard because their truths and morals don't align with God. You know, that's really seeing God as a threat. He's an inconvenience. He gets in the way. It's frustrating. We need to remind ourselves sometimes, you know, why did Jesus come? Did, did, did God, who is, I mean, did God, did Jesus, did he come to threaten Herod? I mean, that's what Herod thought. And he just completely lashed out. But he wasn't. Jesus came to be his savior. Was Did Jesus come to be a threat to the religious leaders? Throughout Jesus' ministry, that's what they thought. He, for some reason, they just, they couldn't, and I think we could probably cite why they, they didn't like, I mean, he was a threat to their standing and to some traditions and all these other things, but that's not why he came. Did Jesus come to be a threat to you and your life? Absolutely not. Not in the least, but Jesus came to be a light in a world darkened by sin, a world where without him there is no hope and there is no peace and there is no joy. Jesus came to testify to the truth, and it's the truth that sets us free. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. He came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's why Jesus came not to be a threat. Jesus came to bring peace and, and to bring joy. He came um, to give eternal life. Don't see God as a nuisance and don't see Jesus as a threat. That's not why he came. He came for all these other reasons. And or maybe the complacency of the chief priests and the teachers of the law is something that resonates with you. They had God's word, right? They had the Old Testament scriptures. They had the prophecies. They had the details. They were the experts. That's why Herod called them in. You know how it is. A, a, a ruler has some of the best minds, uh, it, it, you know, accessible to, to him or her. And so he called in the people that he thought were the best minds. And again, it was it really was purely academic for them. They did the research. They found the answer. They quoted the Bible verse and, and, and they moved on. You know, we, we have a lot of facts as well in both the Old and the New Testament. We have a lot of details. We have a lot of information. We have a lot of accounts. 
from the Bible, uh, for example, we have, you know, the, the, the days of creation, the creation account, we have the life of Abraham, we have uh, the interactions of Jesus, we have the, the missionary journals, journeys of the Apostle Paul, and that's awesome, that's good information to have, isn't it? Th- those are wonderful details, wonderful truths, there's, there, there's so much in there for us to learn and grow, but it's, excuse me, it's not, it's, it's not merely academic, and it's not merely historic. I mean, creation highlights God's power and wisdom. The life of Abraham demonstrates God's grace and, and, and a much greater, grander plan. Jesus' interactions, wow, they, just, they, they show us God's patience and his goodness and his empathy and his humility and his kindness and his love. The journeys of Paul demonstrate God's care and concern for every single soul. Don't just read information. Don't just listen to historic accounts as they're being read in in worship or wherever it may be. Process God's word. Digest it. Apply it to you. Let it be real for you. You know why? Because it is. It is real to you. It is real for you. Take a page from the playbook of these wise men. I mean, they prioritized Christ in their lives. They pursued him, right? They, they wanted nothing more to be in his presence. They, they followed this star from the east. Who knows how long it had been, right? They, they, they found peace and hope and joy in their savior despite that long, inconvenient journey. I, you don't get the sense that they thought it was inconvenient, but many would think it is. They found peace, hope, and joy in their savior despite the cold reception in, in, in Jerusalem and the scheming of Herod. They... They found peace, hope, and joy in their Savior despite the, that messed up thing that Herod did, which is sometimes called, in artwork, I guess it's called the, the slaughter or the massacre of the innocents. And, and I share that because I'm going to come back to that word shortly. But, you know, back to those questions, how could God let this happen? Well, correction, it's not God's fault. It was Herod's choice. It was Herod's doing. It was Herod's decision. It was Herod's fault. Why? What what was the point of all this? Again, you'd have to ask Herod, but um, I'm not sure we want to dissect the mind of such an individual. But I do bring that question up, though. Why? What was the point of all this? Because, again, it's a natural, logical question. And also because I'd like to tweak that. There's a better question to ask here. And that is, instead of why, what was the point? The question is, well, what did God accomplish? in all of this? What was God's point? Well, he fulfilled prophecy, right? He executed his plan of salvation. What Herod did was horribly wrong. It was horribly unfair. It was just downright horrible. But Jesus dying on the cross wasn't fair either. And and, and thank and praise God that it wasn't, right? Because Isaiah says, by his wounds, we are healed. Jesus is, again, we talk about the slaughter or the massacre of the innocents. Jesus is the ultimate innocent. The, and that ultimate innocent would one day be declared guilty so that his innocence could be given to you and to me as a gift. The ultimate innocent had his life spared here in Matthew chapter 2 so that later on he could give his life as a ransom for many, as a payment for the sins of the world. The ultimate Innocent, that is Jesus, was rejected by his father on a cross so that we could be reconciled by that same God and welcomed into his heavenly kingdom. For even though God spared his son here in Matthew chapter 2, later, as it says in Romans 8 verse 32, God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. And and this is this is why we celebrate Christmas. Because on the other side of the cradle is the cross. And on the other side of of the chaos in corruption is the peace and the perfection of heaven. And and that's that's the benefit of being able to take a step back as as we do and see the bigger picture. We're we're 2000 years removed, more than 2000 years removed from this event from Matthew chapter 2. And so we can look at Old Testament prophecy uh, and, and, and the fulfillment. We can look at the events surrounding Jesus' birth. We can look at his life, his ministry, his death, his resurrection, his ascension. Uh, we can look at 
at, at the rest of the New Testament. We have the Old Testament and the New Testament, life of Christ, and then all the all the all, all the teaching and the commentary of, of of Christ's life. And we and, and all that helps us to see and to understand God's plan and purpose, his wisdom and his work. But the thing is, in our daily lives, we don't always have the benefit of seeing the bigger picture. But we need to remember that God does. When there are messed up people and messed up events in the world around us, and there always will be in a sinful world, in a messed up sinful world, uh, we need to remember that, and, and this is a, a an, uh, an illustration that my friend I just heard from her friend not too long ago. I thought it was, I like it. We need to remember that that we're playing checkers while God's playing chess. And, and by that, you know, the point is we're focused on what's right in front of us. In checkers, you can think ahead a little bit and, you know, maybe you're doing a couple of jumps or something. But for the most part, you're just... And, and that's how we are, just focusing on what's 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 in front of us, what we can see, what we're experiencing right now, how we're feeling in this moment, things like that. Meanwhile, God's playing God's playing chess. He sees the whole board. He sees the bigger picture. He knows the end game. He's thinking ahead. And chess, you think, moves and moves ahead. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine moves ahead. God is thinking ahead, and he's working it all out for your salvation at every move. That doesn't mean that we go through life unscathed. It doesn't mean that that God steps into every difficult situation to rescue us. It doesn't. He lets life play out oftentimes. But again, in all of it, he sees the big picture. He knows the end game. He's thinking ahead and he's working out your salvation at every turn. And, 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 And what that means then is that sometimes there is no logical explanation. Sometimes, and we should do this all the time, but sometimes the only thing we can do is rest in the promises and and the track record of our loving God. And, and, and to say to ourselves, you know, God has positioned me in this, at this time, in this place, in this pain, in this messed up situation or event for his great purpose. And I can't see it right now. And, and, and all I know is that it certainly feels awful, but but by God's grace and his promises, everything is part of his plan. Everything is part of his purpose to bring me to eternal life. This has Romans 8, 28 written all over it, doesn't it? And we know that in all things, Paul writes to the Romans, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. Yes, we live in a messed up sinful world. Yes, we ourselves are messed up sinful people. Yes, we are surrounded by messed up sinful people. Yes, we regularly deal with messed up situations, which are a result of sin. And yes, Jesus came into the mess to be with us in the mess. Jesus allowed himself to be messed up when he was abused and crucified. And yes, Jesus, in doing so, he saved us from our biggest mess, which is sin and death, eternal death. As he continues to to use all the messed up and not messed up things in our lives to carry out his plan of of eternal salvation, our eternal salvation with him, where there is absolutely nothing messed up at all. Because heaven is a place where there's no death or mourning or crying or pain. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, uh, again, as we consider the world around us, uh, a messed up sinful world, uh, ourselves and, and, and other situations and people that we deal with, we praise and thank you for being with us in the mess, for coming to save us from the mess of sin. Uh, we, we we know, Lord, and, and give us confidence and peace in knowing that that you are always present, uh, that your plan and power are always at work in our lives and, and that you are in fact always, always, always at work in all things for our spiritual and eternal good. Let, the, let, let this truth give us peace and comfort, um, especially as we deal with, with um, very difficult situations in life, whatever they may be right now, uh, the most, <laughs> obvious thing is a pandemic. And uh, we ask you to give us peace and knowing that even though um, you don't step in and, and rescue us from every difficult situation, we still know that you love us. And we still know that you have us in these situations according to your plan and purpose. And ultimately that plan and that purpose is to take us to eternal life. And one day you will. 
So we thank you for coming to this world, for being in the mess, for fixing our mess, and, and, and one day you'll deliver us from this mess to eternal life with you in heaven. We pray all these things in the name of our Savior Jesus. Amen.